Good morning, church. It is so great to see all of you this morning. Welcome to our streaming worship on this fifth Sunday after Pentecost. This morning, we are continuing with our summer series, Unraveled, Seeking God When Our Plans Fall Apart. If you're visiting with us this morning, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. I'm Pastor Chris, and I am so grateful to be worshiping together this morning. If you want to know more about who we are, I invite you to visit our website at newhopelc.org. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me. I am at pastor at newhopelc.org, or you can email our admin at info at newhopelc.org. We're coming to you this morning from the southwest corner of our community center, where next week, just over there, just off to my left, we will be beginning demolition and installation on a, a new air conditioning unit for the south side of our community center, the south side classrooms. This is the first project of our capital campaign. Third church, thank you to your generosity. We are able to begin this work. If you haven't had the opportunity yet to contribute to our capital campaign, more information will be coming out shortly. But in the meantime, you can still contribute. Uh, simply mark your gift or donation uh, to 2020 Capital Campaign, and we can get started on more projects like our AC unit. Church, we also want to encourage you to share this worship service with your friends and family. Email it out to folks who may not have an online worship service to attend. Post it to your social media feeds, your Facebook pages. This is like super easy evangelism. Simply share this video. It is good to gather together in worship this morning. So many things are weighing on our hearts and on our minds these days. This pandemic has gone on longer than I, any of us thought it would. Our siblings of color, our LGBTQIA2 plus neighbors, and our friends who are most vulnerable are imploring us not to neglect our baptismal calling to continue to work for God's justice. And so many of us are worn out. Dare I say, we are weary. And it's in the midst of all of this that our summer series, Unraveled, feels particularly appropriate. Remember, church, that our call as disciples of Jesus is to bear one another's burdens. We are called to rejoice with those who are rejoicing, to weep with those who are weeping, and to suffer with those who are suffering. And it's in the midst of all of this that God in Christ Jesus is most especially present. God is present here. There is a separate video with all of our COVID-19 specific announcements related to our campus closure and the suspension of in-person activities. Also how to stay up to date with all the happenings here around New Hope. And that video is posted down in the description. We have two opportunities to join, uh, log on and stay connected during these times, Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. and again Wednesday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. The connection info for both of those is in our Thursday afternoon e-blast. If you're not already connected to our e-blast and you'd like to be, please send an email to info at newhopelc.org with the word e-blast in the subject line and we'll get you added to our distribution list. This morning for our faith formation time, our Sunday morning check-in time, uh, with our new Unraveled series, we're continuing with our Sunday School for all ages, from our youngest members to our oldest members and everyone in between. This morning, we're talking about discovering a new path. And we hope that you will join us this morning and that we'll get to see your bright and shining face uh, in this multi-generational multi conversation. Virtual day camp is coming. We are so excited to share this with you. Mark your calendars now, church, for July 13th through 17th, and keep your eyes open for more information that will be coming out soon. We're so excited. We can't wait to share this with you. Also continue to see the announcements in our Thursday afternoon e-blast for how you can support our many partner ministries right from home during this time. Especially this week, note the uh, opportunity to volunteer for Family Promise that's coming up in a couple of weeks. 
A reminder, church, that although we aren't gathering together physically, your continued offering is needed during this time. The staff and the volunteers at New Hope are still working incredibly hard to bring you these worship services and all of the incredible resources. Also, all the partner ministries I just mentioned are also dependent on us for our support. So however you can give, uh, you can mail in your offering, you can drop it by the office through the mail slot in the middle door of the office building. You can also very easily give online. However you give, please do continue to give your offering as you're able. Church, we want to encourage you to participate in worship this morning. These are certainly difficult days, and I think that we need to hear the good news of God's liberation in our lives. God promises to show up, and God is present here in our midst. This worship service happens because you are a part of it. You are participants in worship. So set this time apart. Grab your Bible or open the Bible app on your phone. Follow along with uh, the readings with us. We encourage you to sing along with the hymns that will be up on your screen. We invite you to truly worship this morning. Grab your coffee, prop your feet up, and settle in. Make this space sacred. Light a candle, sit on the floor, whatever helps you to set this time and this space apart. Welcome to worship. We begin by confessing our sin, the ways that we separate ourselves from God and from one another, and hearing God's radically inclusive word of forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to trust that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Your sin is forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
pray. You are great, O God, and greatly to be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may trust in you, call upon you, know you, and serve you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Acts. Now, meanwhile, Saul, who was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if Saul found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound back to Jerusalem. Now, as Saul was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul asked, who are you, my Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, the one whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. Now the men who were traveling with Saul stood speechless because they heard the voice, but they saw no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and he neither ate nor drank. Now, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. Ananias answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to Ananias, Get up and go to the street called Eutheon, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man and how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the whole people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he is to suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and his sight was restored. Then Saul got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And for several days, Saul was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately Saul began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, Surely this Jesus is the Son of God. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Jesus said, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn, for John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. And the son of humanity came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a, a glutton and a drunkard, and a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by wise deeds. And at that time, Jesus said, I thank you, God, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, and have revealed them to infants. Yes, God, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by God, and no one knows the Son except God. 
and no one knows God except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal God. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Please pray with me this morning, church. Holy God, your people are weary. Their souls are longing for rest. Lead us to abide in your restful grace today. Help us to rest, that we might be energized for the work to which you have called us. Amen. So for my very first Father's Day this year, Tiffany and Oliver got me this wonderful contraption that straps on my shoulders, and it lets Oliver sit up on top of them, which, which he really likes to do. It's a carrier, but rather than strapped to my back or in front, this one puts him up kind of up above everything where he can easily look around and see everything that's going on. We used it for the first time last Sunday when we went out on a, a short hike over by our house. It works well, it turns out. It's nice and good. Like I said, he likes to be up on my shoulders anyway, so this is a great thing for that. But, but here's the thing. Once you're all strapped up and in, there's really no shifting around. You can take it off and put it back on. You can take the kid out or put them back in, but it doesn't really shift that well. So you're pretty much stuck that way until you're done. And we all know that, well, we've got a pretty big kid, right? He's growing, which is great and wonderful, but he's like close to 25 pounds now. So like not the easiest thing to have strapped on top of your shoulders and walk around with for an hour. That yoke is neither easy, nor is that burden light. And my shoulders are really just now starting to stop being sore. And all of this makes me wonder, church, what are you carrying around? What burdens are you shouldering? What aches and pains are weighing you down? Maybe even what wounds are you bearing these days? As we work our way through our summer series, Unraveled, we're exploring themes of the places in our life and in our world where things have come unraveled, where things are in the process of unraveling, and where things are in need of becoming unraveled. And this morning, we encounter Saul in this well-known story of his experience on his way to Damascus. And a little backstory for you, right? Saul was from Tarsus, which is in modern South Central Turkey. He was Jewish, a Pharisee, actually, and from a very devout Pharisaic family. He was in Jerusalem, and he asks for letters from the high priest so that he could go to Damascus and bind and bring back any Christ believers that he finds on his way. Saul was a persecutor of the early Christ-believing communities, and a somewhat vicious one at that. See, Saul was present for the stoning of Stephen, the first murder of a Christ-believer, what in the church we call the first martyr of the faith. After that, Saul would also go into the houses of Christ-like believers and take them, or the houses of Christ-believers, and take them away to prison. It seems that Saul derived some particular form of satisfaction from oppressing early Christ believers. Also, church, it's important to note here that I am using the term Christ believers purposefully. See, Christians didn't exist yet. 
The early Christ-believing communities were Hebrew and Greek people who had come to believe that Jesus was, in fact, the Christ, the Messiah. They were either Jewish Christ believers or Greek Christ believers. The earliest Christ believing communities never really stopped being Jewish or Greek. They still maintained many of their customs, and it wasn't until later in Antioch that Christ believers started being called Christians. So Saul's on his way to Damascus to arrest some more Christ believers, and he has this otherworldly encounter with the risen Christ. Saul, why do you persecute me? This encounter literally knocks Saul down. He fell to the ground, and it literally changed him. It blinded him, and he wasn't able to see. Saul has a transformation, spiritual, physical, and emotional. Saul is completely transformed and changed. Transformation is a lived experience. Contrary to how we approach our faith most of the time, this transformation is something physical, visceral, and embodied. So often we think our exercises of our faith as having to do with our mind. Church, you can't intellectualize a transformation. It's something you feel. It's something you experience. And this transformation, I think we could say it saved Saul. It certainly took him from this one road that he was on and picked him up and set him on an entirely new path. Saul would later be known as the Apostle Paul, one of the most prolific writers and ardent defenders of the Christian faith. I think we could say that this transformation saved Saul. And as is true with us, church, you can't intellectualize salvation. It's something you feel and experience. It's something that happens to you. Which is why I talk so much about liberation being about action. We can talk about issues and problems and discuss ways to address them, but until we lace up our shoes, get out and actually do something about injustice, nothing will change. It took an encounter with the risen Christ for Saul to do a complete about-face and transform from a zealous persecutor of Christ followers to one of the most zealous proclaimers of Jesus the Christ as Savior and Lord. I think there's a good argument to be made here for Paul's zeal in proclaiming Christ as Messiah as being an attempt to make up for how brutally he treated the Christ-believing community before his encounter with the risen Christ on his way to Damascus. I think Paul is trying to outdo himself for the years he spent viciously persecuting those who professed the name Christ. So what's been a turning point for you in your life, church? What has it taken for you to undergo this same kind of radical transformation? How can we allow that transformation to move us from a place of intellectual understanding to an embodied faith? How can we be transformed from a passive discipleship to an active discipleship? For me, it was moving to Chicago. It was leaving the North Texas suburb that I had grown up in and in many ways was all I knew. And moving to a place where I could see injustice. It took people pointing certain things out to me, being patient with me and, and explaining them to me. They didn't have to do that, but I am so incredibly grateful they did. And ultimately, church, it took my willingness to change. Ultimately, people of God, transformation happens because you're open to it. If you're willing to have your hearts broken open and changed. So what does it take for you to be moved from a place of agreeing that an injustice has occurred 
to a place of actively working to right that injustice. Church, I would argue that's what's needed in this time that we find ourselves in. We need to not only recognize the injustices present, but those who are affected by these injustices need us who have been made uncomfortable to get to a place of joining in the work to correct these injustices. This, this is the work of discipleship. This is the work to which you were called in your baptism. It's not easy work, taking on systems and structures and people in power. You will need every bit of energy and stamina and faith you can muster for this work. And that's why, people of God, rest for your souls is important. How can you pour into and fill others up when you yourself are empty? Rest is a holy and good thing. It is commanded. We need to be well rested for this work. But we cannot remain at rest. This yoke is easy and the burden is light. Working to right injustice is the easiest and the hardest thing you will ever do. Easy because it only requires you to recognize the image of God in someone else and their worthiness as a beloved child of God. Difficult because it requires you to give up something of yourself. Maybe it requires some unlearning on your part. Maybe it requires some growth in understanding in some areas that you were previously so sure of. Maybe it requires examining what you once knew, what you once thought you knew, and being willing to admit that you have been wrong. Difficult because it requires you to show up a movement from passive to active discipleship. The yoke is easy and the burden is light, but it is a yoke nonetheless. There is still some measure of burden to being a disciple of Jesus. There is something required of you as a disciple. Being a disciple of Jesus demands your life, that you lose your life in, other, in order to find it, that you give up your life for the sake of the other. To, the call to Christian discipleship is one of giving up, of letting go, of becoming unraveled, of relinquishing. It's a call to servanthood, a race to the bottom, there is certainly a cost associated with this discipleship. There is a yoke. There is a burden. But they are easy and light. Find some time to rest this weekend, church. Find some time in your lives for rest and renewal. God knows your souls need it. Rest up because you're needed. Your voice, your actions, your very self. You are needed in this moment. Get some rest. Then put that easy yoke back on your shoulders.
into unity with one another and the whole creation, praying separately in our homes and together in the spirit. Let us pray for our shared world. We pray for the church. Sustain us as we share your word. Embrace us as we struggle to find our common ground. Lift up leaders with powerful and prophetic voices. Free us from stagnant faith. We pray for the well-being of creation. Protect the air, water, and land from abuse and pollution. Free us from apathy in our care of creation and direct us towards sustainable living. We pray for all the nations. Guide leaders in developing just policies and guide difficult conversations. Free us from patriotism that hinders relationship building. Lead us to expansive love for our neighbor. We pray for all in need for all who are tired, feeling despair, sick, or oppressed. Take their yoke upon you and ease their burdens. Give your consolation and free us from all that keeps us bound. Be present with those suffering, those who are dying, those stranded away from home and loved ones, those who have lost their employment, and those who are filled with worry and anxiety. Uphold healthcare workers and medical researchers as they work on our behalf. Assist the unemployed in finding work. Help us provide safe housing and daily food for those in need in our country and around the world. Comfort your people. Especially we pray for those we now lift before you, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We pray for this congregation. Bless pastors, deacons, and congregational leaders. Energize faith formation volunteers, church administrators, and those who maintain our building. Shine in this place that we might notice the ways your love transforms our lives. In the midst of anxiety, fear, grief, and pain, help us to be mindful of opportunities for rejoicing. We give you thanks for the many blessings you have given to us, including those we now lift before you, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We give thanks for those who have died in faith. Welcome them into your eternal rest and comfort us in our grief until we are joined with them in new life. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. In your goodness, nourish and strengthen us that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Church, let us pray together the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Church, as you share Christ's peace with one another, receive this benediction. Neither death, nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. May God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Sustainer bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ has called you and sent you. Thanks be to God.